This graphic by Richard Millwood of Learning Theory is useful in helping us to conceptualise the key writers that have influenced the scholarship of teaching and learning. What I want to do is begin with the work of John Dewey and work around the horseshoe highlighting principal writers who have influenced the scholarship of teaching and learning. Beginning with John Dewey, his work from 1910 on focuses on the role of education and experience. And here, Dewey connects us back to the 19th century American philosophical tradition of pragmatism, in which he thinks about the evidence that you need to gather in order to ascertain certain truth claims. What has survived and is still pertinent in thinking about the role that Dewey plays as a foundation writer in the scholarship of teaching and learning is the role of evidence. What counts for evidence in my teaching? How do I gather that evidence? And how do I use that evidence in order to help me better understand my teaching and student learning. Now moving this way down the horseshoe we next come to the writings of Ivan Illich. Illich wrote a study called De Schooling Society in the 1970s and was interested in a theme that is pertinent within the 21st century particularly in higher education where the institution is moving from knowledge acquisition to knowledge application and thinking about the type of learning that we need to foster within higher education that is authentic to the application within society. Illich is also useful in thinking beyond the institutional structure of schools and universities and thinking of different modalities of learning and teaching and here we're encountering blended learning online learning what are the changes that are taking place within these new modalities of learning moving further down the horseshoe again we come to the work of Chris Agris and Donald Schoen. Their work emerges from organisational learning and allied with this is the work of David Cole, who draws on experiential learning. But Schoen's work in particular on double loop learning is thinking about the metacognitive the learning to learn. And again, this is a dimension of higher education that is becoming more pertinent. If, as a teacher, we want our students to be able to understand, then we also need to understand the processes by which learning takes place. That learning is not just cognitive, it's also cultural. And this element of the culture of learning is something that is picked up in our next pair of theorists, Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger. Drawing from social anthropology, they think in terms of learning as situated within a community of practice. Again, within the discourse of the scholarship of teaching and learning, we are interested in fostering and promoting a community of practice. But communities of practice are also integral to the life and function of the university. When students enter into higher education, they learn within disciplines and professions. So if we want our learners to be authentic within that disciplinary world, 
we need to foster opportunities for them to be inculcated and brought into a community of practice. We need to see these students as potential scholars that are moving through a discipline, first as novices, then as apprentices, and finally as masters of the discipline. Moving around the horseshoe, we next come to groups of theorists who are integral to cognition within the scholarship of teaching and learning, particularly the work of Levi Gotsky, important as a Russian theorist in the early 20th century. Once his work is translated into English in the 1970s, it's very popular in education departments. But his big idea is the zone of proximal development. And this is connected to the ways in which students learn. So it connects back to the metacognitive. But it's also a foundation principle for new theories from the 2010s, particularly Myron Land thinking about threshold concepts and where students get stuck in knowledge acquisition and progression through the domain of knowledge, which can be a discipline or profession. And another theory from around the same time, David Pace and his colleagues in Indiana University on decoding the disciplines. And here Pace and his colleagues interviewed masters of the discipline, disciplinary experts, and used a type of backward design in order to think about what are the dispositions and characteristics that make a person a master of the discipline. So again, thinking about disciplinary formation as both cognitive and cultural. And again, connected with this is the work of Brunner on uh, scaffolding. And again, if we think about scaffolding, we might think about it as integral to an apprenticeship model of learning. That students need to be directed initially, and then gradually, as they assume mastery of the discipline or profession, we can remove the scaffolding and they are independent uh, thinkers and practitioners in their own right. Scaffolding at its most basic level could be a rubric of an assignment. This is a very useful form of scaffolding because it not only directs the student into uh, the characteristics of an essay or an assessment that we uh, see as best representing uh, good practice within a discipline and profession, but it also helps the students to think as a disciplinarian or professional. So rubrics and scaffolding uh, are integral to making visible the processes of learning. Connected to this as well is the work of Howard Gardner, now, Gardner emerges from the Graduate School of Education at Harvard, and he is integral to the multiple intelligences framework and teaching for understanding. Multiple intelligences and teaching for understanding are about making thinking visible, but also they are a foundation principle for models such as universal design for learning, giving students multiple modes of representation and acquisition of disciplinary knowledge. And then we have the work of Bloom and thinking about knowledge, mastery and acquisition. And I suppose where you see Bloom's work in particular is through learning outcomes at module and program level. And if you think about a module outcome or a program learning outcome, what is essential to the attribute of the learning outcome is that it is about the performance of understanding, which is an integral aspect of teaching for understanding. 
what is it that I want my students to be able to know, but then more importantly, what is it that I need my students to be able to do with the knowledge that they have acquired? These are two key questions being asked by Bruner, by Gardner, by Bloom, and also represented in the work of Vygotsky. That knowledge is not just about acquisition, it is about application. And so altogether, these learning theorists give us a framework in which we can ask questions about our teaching and student learning. And together, they comprise theories that can be used for a scholarship of teaching and learning.